But now on one, as the number of male suicides rise, True Lives examines some of the reasons why. In tonight's documentary, Big Boys Don't Cry. Viewers may find some issues dealt with disturbing. Helpline numbers will be available on Airtel, page 740. The trouble really starts when you knock on the door. I'm sorry, I have very bad news for you. Then the guard will say to them, I'm sorry, it is in relation to your son. At some stage, they will ask, is he dead? And it is then that they are ready for the bad news which they are about to receive. We would tell them that we had finished inquiries, we had ruled out foul play and that it wasn't an accident. The worst thing that can happen in this whole area is silence. Don't we allow our fears to control us. I think somebody somewhere needs to have a look at why this is killing people. He had the most magnetic smile. That's why he had the most magnetic smile. I miss that so much. It's not about death, you don't want to die. You haven't got a desire to die. What you do want is you want the pain to stop. Because that's what you feel, you feel pain. It's not a physical pain, but it's a mental pain. Because life becomes almost unbearable. And that's what you want to stop. It becomes the emergency exit from all your problems. Well, obviously, he must have had thought the problem he had was was very vague. But then he wasn't inclined to share it with anyone, or he must have been inclined to share it with anyone. And I suppose he thought it was the only way out for her, but... You know, he, he felt he couldn't discuss it with anyone. And I suppose his problem at that time was big to him. But if he had discussed it with someone, and it would have been very small, more than likely. Nothing, you know, hitches in the eyes. You weren't looking for an out the ordinary of a person who was going around as normal, everyday, happy or lucky, out of the weekend, enjoying himself. You know, you weren't, so you weren't looking for anything like that. And if you were yourself, would we have found it? He was the usual PJ, the happy go lucky lad that came in here. When I came home from down, there was here when I came home down, and they went out, left me that evening. The very same way as he almost did in saying, i see you later, mother, we're off now. And that's exactly what I expected he would do, was to see me later. And that was the last sentence I heard him say. Why did he do it to himself? That would have been my first question. Why to him? You know, he, he thought so much of himself and kept himself so well. I, I, can't, I couldn't understand if it was PJ, how he could have did, gone out and just left life. Because he seemed to enjoy it so well, like? Yeah. Left life, like. Because he loved life. He was a gallery man, like. You know, he was a gallery man, like. And he, he, he'd laugh at a cat passing the floor, like. You know, so. So, like, he had it both ways, like. I mean, he was where he wanted. He was at doing what he wanted to do. And he was enjoying it, and the people whom he was with were enjoying him. And he came home here and it was the same, so... 
He had it both ways. Oh, probably everybody has suicidal thoughts at one stage or other in their lives. It's what the mind does when it's under stress. Uh, initially, it would clamour for solutions and thankfully most often find solutions to problems that, it, that it's confronted with. Uh, but if uh, there are too many problems, or if the person's resilience in dealing with the problems there and then isn't great, uh, they're running out of solutions. And then suicide seems uh, an option that has got to be considered. So in one way there's no mystery, uh, it's a, but it's a hidden story. Yeah, and that is the problem. It's so subterranean. There's just a lot of confusion inside my head, you know, like I couldn't pinpoint really anything, you know. You want self-respect, you want to feel that you're achieving things in life. Things weren't really shaping up the, the, way, the, way, the way that I, that, that I wanted to because, you know, inside, um, although I had this idea of what I wanted to do with my life and who I wanted to be, I was now felt like I was, I was getting there to a certain extent, but still I wasn't happy, you know, there was still something missing and I couldn't even say at the time what it was. So, this emergency exit that I thought about was getting rapidly closer. I couldn't, I couldn't see how things were going to improve. You're still hoping that maybe something is going to happen. Because you ultimately do not necessarily want to die. So I was hoping things would change, but things were not changing. And if anything, they were getting worse. And one day, I eventually said, that's it, I'm out of here. It's like if you had been planning to leave your job, you were looking around for another job, and one day you went in, and somebody said something to you, and you just said, I don't care anymore, I'm out of here. And that's the way I treated life at the time. I said, I have had enough, I am gone. You couldn't have torn me back. I had made up my mind and said, definitely, tonight, this is it, this is all over. When I woke up and I just thought, how can I still be here? I said, I should not be here, I've failed. And I was absolutely gutted, disgusted. We know that up to two-thirds of people who die by suicide have a previous attempt and they're the people I think that it's very important to target for help. It's not enough to help somebody through the current uh, crisis. What we need to do is to try and help them to face problems that they're going to face in everyday life. It's not the problem that uh, is, is, is the difficulty, it's our reaction to it. You know, it's not an event uh, or a stress or whatever. It's how we perceive that and how we react to it is, is the important thing. When people are well and we take it for granted, we can see when something goes wrong, well, I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll phone so-and-so, I'll uh, go on a holiday and <laughs> do something. Uh, there's always some solution to situations. But when people get distressed, what happens is that their ability to see alternatives shrinks right down suicide. And suicide is very, very hard to predict. At a group level, uh, yes, you've got your demographic variables in terms of being single, living alone, separated, uh, living in rural isolation, being extremely depressed, previous history of suicide and so forth. But when it comes down to dealing with an individual who's suicidal sitting there in front of you, uh, that's a different matter. Those demographics are of very little help, really. Uh, what matters is how the person sees the future themselves. If a person in an acutely depressed state cannot visualise the future, even if they tell you they're not suicidal, they are still a significant risk.
I was only 17 when I had Raymond myself and I felt that I had grew up along with him um, and we were always very, very close. Raymond was a very open boy, uh, very easy to talk to. I don't know that we were taught very much about his, his real deeply personal life, you, you know, we were taught about common interests and things like that there, but I'm sure there's a lot of young people don't tell their mums about what goes on, I mean it's, um, I, I know when I was young I didn't tell my mum everything I was up to, so I'm, I'm sure he had his, his, his secrets and that obviously, I think all young people do, um, and, and perhaps with being a one parent family and, and, and no male at home, uh, maybe I wasn't the one to talk to about, about some things. He was a very popular boy, uh, was well liked and uh, he had two or three very, very close friends. Um, and uh, the phone was always ringing, you know, and they were calling up to the house and that. When he did see them, he was grand. He was up, dressed, washed, out for the night, was okay. They didn't see the Raymond at home, the Raymond who had become a low spirit. At that's why I feel that there's a, a, an awful burden of guilt on me at times because I did see it when I didn't recognise it. Um, his behaviour changed, uh, his appetite changed, his eating habits changed. He just wasn't taken, he was always a very well dressed boy and very proud of his appearance. I said he wasn't taking as much care of himself as he used to. Um, he, was, he would tend to be awakened a lot through the night and sleep a lot through the day. Uh, but these, I mean, and I, I did ask him about these changes in behaviour, but it seemed to have very feasible reasons for it. Um, the, the, uh, the television was much more interesting late at night than it was through the day. Um, he wasn't going out, so he didn't shave that day. Um, he was either trying to build himself up by eating certain things, or he had bought weights and, and he was buying those protein drinks. Uh, so, so I just, I mean, every reason he gave me for his change in behaviour uh, seemed to be quite feasible to me. I felt as if I was scolding him about being bored uh, and he would have been quite, quite irritable. And I always had the, the answer for you that it did seem feasible and that I was fussing on Julie. I was fussing about nothing. But I, th I think he was depressed and... and once he went down that road, I think it must have been hard for him that he couldn't get turned back, not without help. And he obviously wasn't asking for help, or if he was asking for help, nobody picked it up. We didn't notice, we didn't know the signs, we couldn't read it. Um, and that's always something that I blame myself for, you know. I don't know whether it's because it, that it was that I didn't recognise the signs, or whether perhaps I was too busy. He said he was tired, uh, that was a, a, a main thread that ran through it, that he was very tired, uh, that he wanted to, to just to, to blot everything out, to sleep really. I don't think in the end of the day that he realised the finality of, of what his actions were going to mean. Um, he just wanted to end his problems and this was the, this was the only way he could see. Uh, he, he mentioned people that he loved and friends that had made his life good. Um, and said that he was sorry, but this was the only way he could see it, of the end on the pain. The major problems, you don't talk to anyone, you just deal with them. That's what I do, deal with them in my own on. head. You know, at the end of the day, the only person that can help you is yourself. Mm. I'll just sit here and get drunk, go home, and get to work, get up for work and run. When we drink, we talk about... Sex, football... Shit, actually. Drink, so work. General, run-of-the-mill, sort of skimming, kind of the you top of life. I was work. Yeah. That sort of thing. Never um, really delving too deep. No. Nah. So a lot of the time I would just sit in bed, watch TV and just mill it over my own head. Get on, get on with it. Now that's exactly what it is, you deal with it yourself. You Although there are some people who don't deal with it and they obviously, but you just call them people now. A core defining aspect of masculinity is silence, you know. Men tend to avoid getting help because we don't feel like we need it, because we can get over this, because we're men, aren't we? We're real men, like. Signs of weakness are punished. Um, you're not allowed to show your, 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 your vulnerability. Um, you're not allowed to show your emotional side. And in fact, young men 
aren't allowed to acknowledge that they've got an emotional side most of the time. You know, some people argue that the only legitimate emotion that men can express is anger and aggression. That we're not allowed to feel sad, we're not allowed to admit often to feeling affectionate or loving even. So, you know, if you're going to talk about how you feel, express your needs, so on and so forth, then you're either gay or a woman, you're feminine, so you're not a real man. And if you're gay, um, the pressures uh, are, are huge. There was one survey done that showed that when women were asked what they were most afraid of, they said, you know, being raped or attacked. Uh, and what men said they were most afraid of was being laughed at. When they're in the job, they're talking about the pub, and when they're in the pub, they're talking about the job. And so a lot of times that's the way it was. Or I was talking about football. Or I was maybe talking about um, girlfriends or something like that. But you never talk talked about yourself. Depression really got a hold of me. I was sl slowly going down. But the strong will, the hard man in me, like, you know what I mean, didn't want to really kind of admit that I'm depressed, I suffer from depression. And um, that was the rock that I nearly perished on. For me, it was um, a lot of anxiety, depression. My days were, were, were full of fear, fear, fear. And sometimes I didn't know what I was afraid of. But this constant, even physical feeling of fear. And it's like a kind of a, a complete emptiness inside there. It's like a hole. That black dog has fallen me again. In other words, the self-esteem was down in the, the end of the boots. God knows, like, you know what I mean? I didn't want to die. I just, I, I, like, you know what I mean? There's no way that I want to die. But the pain of, of, of everyday living was too much. It might sound selfish. That, like, you know what I mean? You're only thinking of yourself. But I did think of other people. I agonised over it. But then again, I had crossed the threshold. I'd crossed that line where, you know what I mean? Life wasn't worth going on like this. And I came to a stage where I actually said, This is the day. This is the day. And this is the evening where I'm going to do it. I wanted this emotional turmoil that was inside me to stop. And I wanted it to stop, at, I suppose, at any cost. If we look at mental illness, what is it? It's basically when a person is severely emotionally distressed to a point where they feel they can no longer cope. Now, a lot of people come up to the wire on that one. Um, some go over it in, into the point of being distressed beyond their coping ability. But at, this, at the same time, um, Mental illness really shouldn't be looked on in such a black and white way. It's very relative. I think it's useful to think of it that we can all be a bit crazy. Don't be afraid of the word mental. It's, it's always been a big taboo. Mental. It's shame is one of the big things. Shame, shame, shame. And it's a false shame. It's like a bottle of smoke. Worried, anxious, embarrassed, unable to talk with your family or friends. Don't get down. Get it's to say to the young men like that, you know, talking about emotional issues is not a sign of weakness. You know, it's a sign of maturity. Young men in their own minds are indestructible. But like when they face maybe an emotional or psychological crisis for the first times in their lives, they just don't know what to do. You'd be standing in a shop centre or that and you'd be handing out um, these helpline cards and young fellas say, oh no, no, I don't need that, like, you know, and I just say to them, maybe someday you might have a friend who, who might need it and wouldn't it be great to be able to help him in some way? One of the things that we do in this kind of society is that um, because men will say, look, I'm fine, I don't want that, I don't want any information about suicide prevention or mental health or, you know, how to look after myself, sure, I'm fine, grand, like, um, and, you know, so we, 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 we buy into that, we accept it. Um, but we need to be proactive with men. We need to go at them. We need to say to them, look, 
you're not all right and you might not be all right you know so we have to stop colluding with the the myth of invulnerability um, and go after them whether it's as professionals or as members of the GAA or as members of the church or as family members Which I think if anyone that gets into that way, you have to talk. You have to go and you know, talk to a friend or talk to someone. Like they think their problem is a fierce big one, like, but it can be made very small if they talk to someone. And it doesn't have to be a, a professional person. Like, you know, it have to be a friend, it have to be someone. They even talk, share their problem. There's no door so firmly closed that it can't be opened. You know, if they just let somebody in, give somebody permission to get in there inside that door and, uh, and talk. You know, if they open the door to the friend and pick a good friend, like we'll say, with a closed mouth and, and open up, I think that's the very the most important thing, like. Society conditions us in particular ways. I mean, young men, uh, while they may be very different from young women in the way they can communicate things, are virtually, I think, from birth trained not to communicate. And I think the rest of society is trained not to listen very carefully. The medical profession are listening, the Samaritans are listening, but this is not the preserve of a few. Everyone can help in this regard. Everyone can do something. It may only be a case of folding the newspaper and putting it away, turning off the television and saying, I'm here for you now. Please tell me what's really going on for you. I'm giving you the time. We have to be very careful not to say to people, things will get better. How can we really know what is happening in somebody's life but certainly by listening in an active way to an individual as they talk about their concerns that can help them to realize that there may be more avenues open to them I think we have to be very careful how, how we speak about this because you know sometimes the way we talk about young men and their inability uh, to cope and to solve problems, one, one would feel that they don't manage at all, you know. And what we have to say, of course, is that perhaps the two sexes in many ways are more the same than they are different. Um, that most men, after all, uh, most young men do cope with their problems and, and do grow and develop uh, to be quite good citizens. And it's interesting to ask, why is it people don't harm themselves when they have suicidal thoughts? And time and time and time again, it'll come back to the same thing. They have a link, they have a visual image in their mind of something that they're hanging in there for. We're all bonded to somebody, and it's that bond, ultimately, that is the best to turn to suicide. Now, when people are depressed, very often it's difficult to maintain that bond. Um, but it, the onus is on people who aren't depressed to recognise the need to maintain that bond and to enable it to grow. Was there anything at that stage, particularly say your children or your mum, where you would go, I can't do it because of that? You'll justify it inside your mind. You know, like you, you, you'll tell yourself that everybody, well, you'll, you'll go through each person individually and you will come up with an excuse. You will justify it. And basically, you just go through everybody and say, they'll get over it. They'll get over The patient with suicidal ideas will often develop the, if you like, uh, the blind spot that it's not going to affect others. And I think if we're going to tell the whole truth, people who engage in suicidal ideas, including uh, contemplating suicide, have got to know that uh, survivors, in other words, people who have lost people to suicide, do not get over it as easily as the uh, suicidal individual thinks. And in most cases, um, will never get over it. 
the the amazing thing is like when when those people come to you, they find that the first thing that they say to you is, "Why didn't you tell me?" And then you say to them, "I didn't want to bore you with my troubles." And they say, "Well, your death would have been a burden, you know. I would have been." They say, "You know, they would have been devastated if I would have died." And they talk differently, and they tell you how they would have felt if you would have died. You know, they might say to you, "I'd have been in here. I'd have been on antidepressants. I'd be gone to a psychiatrist. I'd be in therapy. I'd be on drink." And when you, it's then you you begin to realise just what the effect your death would have had on these people, and it's quite. A wake-up call to realise just how how much our death would have affected them, affected our lives. It takes the gloss off your life. It takes the gloss off everything. You try and put it back on, and but it doesn't come because I suppose you know family gatherings, weddings, christenings, let it be whatever. The gap is always there. Never be the same, I think. Never. Not, it's, a, it's, it's never the same. And part of your days with him, I think. Yes. You part know. of your goals with him. I'd say, I'll come here to me to give you a hug. <laughs> That's not exactly why. That'd be the first thing I'd say. And I know well that'd be the first thing he'd say to me. Because he would have said it to me the day before he died. That was the last big hug. It's very much an individual act, it's, it's very personal, but sometimes society has a part to play in that. Generally when you see an increase in the suicide rate, it happens in a particular context. It happens in a society that's changing rapidly where there's enormous social upheaval. That rise happens first and foremost in young men and then it spreads to the rest of society. Not just in the off-coded 15 to 24 year old age group, but maybe more particularly uh, for young men in their 20s and even up to the uh, earlier mid 30s. They, they are the group, I suppose, who definitely account for the rise. Changes, you know, in terms of social values are going to affect the younger generations greater, and because they're the people who are growing up through those social changes. It's not that there's a, a lack of morals; it's that there's so many. I suppose the idea of having more freedom isn't always necessarily a good thing. Well, I think as a country, as a society, we probably are happier overall, but if a country does have a general sense of, of well-being, people who aren't feeling part of that, their isolation or disconnectedness is made more acute and is, is made all the worse by a general pervasive feel-good factor. People say, so, you know, if society has changed, surely it would affect males the same way it would affect females. But I suppose the changes that have happened are in relation to the, the family, marriage as an institution, and, and working life. And in, in those aspects of social life, things have improved for, for women generally. And there are more opportunities in terms of occupation, but also in terms of family life. Younger males, rather than having increased opportunities, it's more a proliferation of um, not knowing exactly what to be. Because in, in the past, you know, maybe there was a true career path set out, whereas now that's not a given anymore. It's almost as if you could have too much going for you. My old man thinks that the whole world's gone mad. Fast evolving times, like yeah. we're living in. I think it's more yeah. of a ch it's more of a challenge rather than something that freaks you out. Well, everything revolves around money for a start. Really. Yeah. It does. Yeah. There's a lot of things I'd like to do now, plans for the future, but I know I can't do them. You want to get out and yeah. start your own life and you still can't get the money together. And Getting the job, not actually having a job and holding it down, but getting a job, you do expect to progress 
very quickly. I've done the Leaving Cert two years ago, failed, and I still haven't got a clue what I want to do. But that's the build up that people say go to college, you'll get a job straight away. It's not the reality. No. No, the line is not their their materialistic problems. We're talking about. But no, but what other problems do you have? There is a veneer of happiness. Um, if you scratch slightly below the surface, many of the people around us here are dealing with lives of quiet despair. The Samaritans made a decision a few months ago to try out a pilot scheme where we would have volunteers on the streets of the city at weekends. And we believe we're reaching individuals who otherwise may not make contact at all. What we have found is that 90% of those who have made contact with us are young men in that high-risk age group. The same issues have been coming up over the years. Feelings of hopelessness, feelings of not fitting in, feelings of isolation. You know, for some people, it's the fact that they don't have a girlfriend, they don't have a boyfriend. Or maybe they started a new job and the job is very stressful. Or they feel that their abilities aren't being recognized. And you know, nothing protects you from that. Whether you have money, friends or family, you may still feel marginalized, still feel isolated. I think it can happen to anyone. Um, I think people today we all think that things are far removed. We see all these social problems, um, and they'll never knock on our door. Unfortunately, they do knock on your door, um, and and can very unexpectedly. I constantly questioned why Raymond ended his life. Um, what were the factors behind it all? What was really getting him down? that he felt so desolate, um, to be in such despair that, that they took those steps. I, I just wanted somebody to blame, and the, the person I still blame is myself. Um, I felt so rejected by him uh, that, that they could leave us like that. Uh, I felt abandoned. I felt fear, terrible confusion, and these awful, awful questions. Um, and if I hadn't, wasn't home that night, if, if I had been home that night, perhaps he might have come to me in the middle of the night when he was at his lowest, obviously, and, and spoken to me. Um, and was Raymond the person I thought he was? Um, I had to think about myself. What kind of parent was I? How could I have not noticed that my boy was suffering? Um, I just had to question everything. Everything about our relationship, about my role as a mother, about my son as I knew him. If you go back 30 years, when you were faced with a severe or potentially severe stress, suicide was not in the equation because the external social, cultural restraints were, were such that suicide was not an option. Nowadays, the external restraint mechanisms, if you like, the environmental restraint mechanisms are nothing as powerful as they were. And so we're now left with the brain as one of the key factors in regulation of unwanted thoughts. And this first test consists of mental activity followed by rest and this will continue for three minutes. Okay? What we're interested in is problem solving strategies and we're interested in how the brain goes about that. Under severe life stress nowadays young men particularly seem to be faced with an early option of suicide as a solution. In other words the problem solving pathways are either not being activated or don't seem to function as effectively the banging is about to begin. What we know for sure is that one of the key neurotransmitters in the frontal cortex that seem to be involved in modulating 
restraint is a neurotransmitter called serotonin. And we certainly know that uh, resting serotonin levels are much lower in men than women. And we know that these lower serotonin levels seem to be associated with uh, increased risk for suicidal behaviour or, if you like, a reduced capacity for restraint in times of crisis. Certainly there are several animal studies that have examined um, how serotonin levels may affect behaviour. It's been noted that the animals with the lowest resting serotonin levels are at increased risk for accidents. They spend more time alone and they spend less time being groomed. One of the commoner accidents is the failed leap. In other words, uh, certain animals will decide to leap from one tree to the other and other animals will decide that maybe they should go down and go up the next tree. Um, and the monkeys that make the leaps uh, demonstrate poor judgment and come to grief. It's not unheard of that you can, if you like, biochemically alter serotonin levels and we know that alcohol is involved in this process. And so if someone has significant stress or impending crisis and they take alcohol in large amounts, they are going to be at increased risk of being unable to inhibit the unwanted thoughts associated with that low mood and that's probably where it directly relates to suicidal behaviour. We know, for instance, that uh, in those countries where the per capita consumption of alcohol has been reduced over the years, the suicide rates have also fallen. And likewise, where um, the per capita consumption of alcohol is rising, suicide rates tend to rise also. One mustn't lose sight of the fact that over the uh, past eight years or so, even though the numbers are still small, the uh, rates and numbers of people, of young ladies taking their own life has doubled. Whereas before, women would talk to you to get a drink. Yeah. Whereas now, yeah, they have, they the have their own money, so they don't, need to, uh, they don't need to talk to fellas they're not interested in just to get a drink off. Yeah. The, the whole focus is, is that you live for your weekends and you go out drinking and that's it. Eight pints at least, move on to nightclub. Shorts. Shorts, vodkas. Bones of a hundred quid, not much change of a hundred quid anyway. I'd say like in the last after in the last year I could count the amount of days that I haven't had a drink in one hand. If you continue drinking for a few days at a time in it, you get more and more into it yeah. and you don't get hangovers as a result. True. If you get your mad days of drinking over and done with when you're younger I'm as well. For you. Yeah, there's better for you. That night she had enough for a few pints. Do you know, which I don't know. I always feel like, you know, that if you have a problem or if you have a couple of problems, like I feel the drink magnifies it. The overindulgence of drink magnifies it. And who knows? Who knows? Bad parents don't cause suicide. But good parents can't prevent it either. And then I, I firmly believe that, like, that's if there's any such thing as a bad parent, like. But certainly the best of parents cannot prevent this. What can they do? Be there for their children. Just be there. Be there, like. And I didn't, you know, just be there. You know, it bothered me some days just to get up and get out of bed. I felt so awful. I just wanted to pull the blankets up over my head and try and pretend it hadn't happened. I felt hopeless. I was so frightened for the future. I didn't know how I was going to live my life without him. Were you concerned about your other son? Yes, very much so. Um, to the point that I made life for him and me very difficult. Um, we sort of became estranged. We couldn't talk to each other about it. Um, my other son had found Raymond's body and had actually had to tell me that my son was dead. It was very difficult for him. Um, it was very difficult for both of us to carry on. I don't think we were any help to each other in our grief. Um, and I became very extremely worried about him. I would, didn't want him to go out. Um, 
And when he did go out, I mean, I was panic stricken to was come home. If he looked, and obviously he was going to look sad and, and down and depressed himself, I was just worried, sick, that something was going to happen to him. That was going to lose the two of them. It is this issue of, you know, could it have been prevented? Um, in some cases, yes, if the signs were known, if the signs were picked up, um, but that is, that is usually in hindsight looking back. 10% of suicides actually conceal all intent. They give absolutely no indication. It's like they're living in two parallel worlds. The vast majority have given some indication be it verbal, be it saying, you know, life is not worth living, or I would like to be dead, or it's not worth going on, or behavioural changes, but some indications have been in there. Nobody at the present time, given our state of knowledge, can predict individual suicide. We know the risk factors, and I mean, the risk factors are really uh, characteristics of a group of people who have taken their own life. So they don't tell you anything about an individual. We know the risk factors, say, in major depression, which may be a bit overstated, that about 15% will eventually take their own life at some stage. Um, but we can't say which 15%. I thought, uh, wrongly, as I, as, as, I, as I look back now, it was the only option. I've had, to, I've had to learn how to talk. I've had to learn how to talk about my feelings without being embarrassed. And talk about personal things. Talk about men things. Talk about men things to women who are in these groups where I um, involved in and some of the a lot of the, the a lot of the um, the openness I have now I got from sitting down in a room where I could listen to women talking about their emotions and also seeing men of my own age and younger men and older men freely talking about their emotions it is a personal thing and it's something that you're extremely reluctant to share with others. And the best thing that you can do is share it with somebody, with anybody. Because the day that you do raise it, if you even mention that to somebody, I would see that as a, as a cry for help. Because you're telling them that somewhere in your head, your problem seems so great that you don't want to live anymore. But you're always going to have people with problems. Mm -hmm. I think the problem is too many people think they have problems. The old-fashioned way was pat on the back, there's nothing wrong, you might get on with it. You're actually asking, you know, professional advice or whatever, people that you don't even know, like, to help you. Like, how can that be constructive? I think a lot of it is psychiatrists and a whole lot of them. I think a lot of it, they're totally keeping themselves in a job. I mean, Jesus Christ, look at the States. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Well, I think They've that's... got psychiatrists for their dogs. It could be changed, but it will take away from the sort of male persona as well. So oh, that's... well, yeah, they become more feminine. We've got to make it uh, acceptable within our culture for men to, first of all, become aware of their feelings and to develop a language that enables that to happen at a very early age in life. And that it's okay to not be perfect, to be imperfect and that there is uh, strength and weakness, in a sense. I think we, we all demand from schools, um, like, you know, high success rates and high pints academically, you know, but we, we should be sort of looking at it in a more balanced way that they would produce an individual who is uh, capable of dealing with problems, capable of dealing with crisis. You know, parents put pressure on teachers, and p teachers deliver what parents want. We do, of course, realise that uh, when we are talking about young male suicides, th those who are most prone to suicidal behaviour and most at risk to taking their own life are those who opt out of the educational system, they fall outside the system. So we have to have a proper mechanism for reaching those people. Yeah. 
largely what's needed is an educational program that starts um, at a very early age because even if at the end of the day you don't make any great impact on the overall suicide statistics, um, an increasing level of emotional awareness uh, enables people to be better citizens, uh, to function better within their work, uh, to uh, evolve better interpersonal skills, managerial skills, uh, helps people with psychological problems to realise that yes, it is legitimate to uh, complain about emotional distress and to seek help. We now realise that depressive illnesses are uh, reckoned by the World Health Organisation uh, to be the second largest illness group worldwide and the cause of uh, enormous uh, degrees of uh, ill health. The whole of society has underestimated the problems of, of uh, mental distress. As we move into a new era, with the degree of change that uh, society is encountering, the whole question is, uh, can uh, the human brain uh, cope with these changes? The evidence is that since the Second World War, it is coping less and less well. The question is, can we as a nation move on with it at this stage, or do we have to count more bodies? If you're watching this program and you think that by saying things about what men need, by expressing our worries about how we feel, uh, about our health, uh, about our sexuality. If people out there watching this program think that by, our, by, by talking about that kind of thing that I'm whining or complaining, um, then I think the problem is out there, like it's not in here. It's, uh, it tells us a lot about how we view men in this society because what it exposes is the underlying assumption that men shouldn't talk like this, you know, that we should just get on with it. I still do suffer from depression. I still I, I suffer from insomnia and, and like, you know what I mean, this thing is still with me and I live with this. But I don't put the emphasis now on depression. The big word for me today is living. I live with it and I carry, I'll carry on living with it. You realise what an important part you do play in others' lives and your value to them increases and ultimately your own self-worth increases to the point where you do want to be around. Somebody said to me once, and I've heard it said before, that suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. And I think basically what that means is if you're in and around that place, give yourself a bit of time. If you would like information or advice regarding any of the issues dealt with in tonight's programme, helpline numbers are available on Airtel, page 740.